Hello friends, welcome back to the shop. Today is Sunday, March 13th, and it is a kind of nice sunny day here in southeastern Pennsylvania, a bit cold. We got some snow yesterday, and surprisingly it accumulated. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, got maybe an inch, less than an inch probably. Problem is it was mixed with rain, it got icy, so I gotta go figure out what to do with the, uh, the sidewalks today. But uh, we'll sort it. Probably just ample salt will take care of it given the sun. Uh, but it was sunny to the point where I had to put up my makeshift cardboard shade to block the, the sunlight coming through. Excuse me while I get a tamper. And of course daylight savings time has begun which has shifted the position of the sun when I make these videos. And it's a nice problem to have, right? Not going to complain about sunshine. So I, I'm going to talk about something a little different today. As you might have noticed from the uh, the intro to this video. But uh, I thought it'd be of interest. It's something that I've been thinking about a lot. And I've been thinking about relative to last Sunday's video. And if you missed last Sunday's video, um, we talked about uh, the fact that all the various events that went into our existence, meaning our parents meeting and their parents meeting and so on and so forth, um, leads you to this thought that, you know, the odds of you existing are very, very low. Now, I got a lot of comments on that video, and I, I really enjoyed them. Um, several folks pointed out, and, you know, quite rightly, that there is cause and effect at play. You know, although it might look like a completely random occurrence that your mom and dad were in the same place at the same time, and that's how they met, there was a reason they went there. there there's, and we do live in a universe where cause and effect rule. Uh, we, we, we do believe that all effects have some cause. We may not know the cause, we may not be able to identify it, but it exists. And if we could identify it, you know, so if we could identify all the cause and effect relationships between all these seemingly chance meetings of people over generations, we could build a model that would allow us to predict you or me or you know, whoever's at the end of that model line. Uh, so that's that's true, but the problem is that there's just too many variables and too many unknowns. So we'd we'd never really be able to build that model. No, but that's fine. That 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 takes some of the sort of spookiness out of the the, the, the theory, if you will. Um, a few people also pointed out that uh, it's not chance, but there may be some something else underlying it. For example, um, the hand of God could be uh, involved in all of that, uh, and in my opinion is involved in all of that, which is a, a really interesting point to consider. But this got me thinking about modeling and, and how we uh, approach our understanding of the world. And we do this, we make assumptions, and we do it all the time. You know, we, in science, they're called simplifying assumptions. I'm going to give you some examples of those because I think I think they're interesting. Uh, but even in day to day life, you know, we, we go to bed at night um, with the assumption that in the morning the sun will rise. Now we can build a mathematical model of the Earth's rotation and all that, and you know, predict it. But most people don't think that way. Most people think that the sun comes up in the morning and it goes down at night, and they have absolute faith that that's going to happen tomorrow. So that's an assumption. And, and there's lots of those in life. That's just the most obvious one that I can think of. So we go through life modeling our existence, modeling, predicting our future based on assumptions, things that we don't actually know are true, but we believe are true. We have to do that. Otherwise, we'd go completely insane trying to calculate everything. 
Now, in science, this happens as well. Uh, there are things called simplifying assumptions that get used all the time in science. And they're necessary uh, for a couple of reasons. But let, let me give you, there's, there's a very famous joke on simplifying assumptions. And this is just one form of the joke. <clears throat> and you've probably heard it if you're in any way involved in the sciences. Or you might have just heard it because it's, it's funny. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to read this because I, I wouldn't be able to remember it or deliver it as well. Um, so here's the joke. Milk production at a dairy farm was low. So the farmer wrote to the local university asking for help from academia. A multidisciplinary team of professors was assembled, headed by a theoretical physicist. And two weeks of intensive on-site investigation took place. The scholars then returned to the university, notebooks crammed with data, where the task of writing the final report was left to the team leader, the, the theoretical physicist. Shortly thereafter, the physicist returned to the farm, saying to the farmer, I have the solution, but it only works in the case of a spherical cow in a vacuum. So in physics and, and mathematics as well, you very often have to make these assumptions about things that simplify the system. So a spherical cow is a ridiculous example of that. But anybody that took even high school physics knows about the assumption of things being in a vacuum or, or, or things being on a frictionless plane, for example. So if you're going to try to calculate how fast a block slides down a plane, you ignore friction because if you don't, the calculations become difficult and, and beyond the, 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 the capabilities of a high school physics student for the most part. Although, I don't know, kids are, kids are smart these days. So that's one sort of simplifying assumption that uh, you see a lot in, in science. And uh, even if you, like I said, even at the high school level, you will, you will see those kinds of assumptions. And they really fall into two categories, in my opinion. There's the ones that make calculations simpler and then we'll talk about another type. Uh, so the ones that make calculations simpler um, are assuming that if we knew all the variables, we'd be able to actually accurately calculate the outcome. But we can sort of fudge by making guesses along the way that let us get to a very appro an approximate but ver relatively accurate answer in the end. There's another joke about this uh, in terms of weather forecasting, where uh, somebody says, well, I, I wrote a computer program that can, with 100% accuracy, predict tomorrow's weather. And I'm like, well, fantastic. Let's, let's use that. And he says, well, there's a problem. What's that? Well, it takes 48 hours for the program to run. The complications are so complex. The, the calculations are so complex that it takes longer to run the program than the time that you're trying to predict. So these kind of things show up a lot um, in statistics, and, and this is something you've almost certainly run into. Uh, there's this concept of the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution. This is what people talk about when they, when they say that they had to uh, force the grades to a curve or fit a curve. There's this bell-shaped curve, and we assume that I can't say everything, but many, many things follow that in terms of their distribution. So if you take a poll of, you know, 100 people asking them, did you like this video? Uh, you can, you, you have to assume, because you take an average, and the average is the middle of that distribution, that those 100 people are normally distributed. The more people you, you poll, the more you can test that assumption. And that's why you should always be very, very critical of any poll that involves a small number of people. Um, and by a small number, I mean less than a thousand. You don't know if that is a normal distribution. And there are ways to mathematically test it, but they don't work very well if you only have a small number of samples. And the truth is they don't work very well even if you have a large number of samples. It would take a whole 30-minute video for me to even explain why they don't work. So we're just going to going to move on from that before I get off on a tangent that I will regret. <laughs> so the normal distribution is, is one of these assumptions. 
uh, in economics, you know, economics is a beautiful science. Uh, it, it, it really is. It, 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 I, I think it's cool. I've never studied it. I've, I've you know, read about it, but I've never taken any classes in economics. But, uh, and I think it takes a special kind of person to, uh, to do that kind of work. But it's trying to get a theoretical understanding of how people spend money, how people save money, how countries spend money, um, businesses. It, it's really interesting stuff. And there's a, a core assumption that's often made in economics, which is that people act rationally to maximize their own self-interest. And, you know, for the most part, it's a, it's a good assumption, but we don't always act rationally. You know, we don't, you know, we buy things on impulse. And we don't always act in our own self-interest. We donate money to charity. We hand a dollar bill to the homeless guy sitting on the street. Um, we do all sorts of things that really don't make sense, and that is a confound in these theories. But there's the assumption that we always act rationally to maximize our own self-interest. So these are things that really make the math easier. You know, if you start adding in variables for you know charitable donations and bin shopping and things, like that, it quickly becomes very very complicated. So you simplify the math, um, and that that's one type of simplifying assumption. The other type is more interesting. Sometimes simplifying assumptions are made to salvage a theory that is otherwise consistent. You know, it makes a lot of sense. That tells us, you know, it's got predictive power. It 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 fits all the data that we have. And then you find something, and you go, uh oh. Now this is interesting to me because. As a scientist, scientific method is based on testing your hypothesis and finding out whether or not it's accurate. If it's accurate, you say, great, let's modify it now and try to predict something else. Let's, let's try to improve it. If it's not accurate, you say, oh, there's something wrong here. Let me see where my theory is wrong. Let me try to fix it. You don't typically assume that the results are wrong. You design the experiment in a way to allow yourself to decide with a high degree of confidence that you can trust that result. Now this falls down when you start to think about observational sciences. So things like cosmology. You can't really run an experiment in cosmology. You can only make observations. So there's an interesting problem in cosmology, and I am not an expert in this area, but I'm, I, I, I love physics. My, my area is biophysics, uh, so I'm, I'm more of a biology guy, but I do like math and physics, and I do read broadly in those areas. So there's a really interesting problem in cosmology where if you calculate the behavior of galaxies just based on our standard understanding of gravity, so the general theory of relativity, you find out that many galaxies would not behave the way they do. They'd behave quite differently. And some would not have formed at all. Uh, others wouldn't move the way that they're, they're moving. Uh, things like galactic collisions, which had been observed, and you know, it's really kind of interesting, uh, they would not occur the way they occur. The math doesn't work. The theory doesn't seem to be correct. But we can fix that, says the cosmologist. All we have to do is assume that the universe is composed of 27% of something called dark matter, 68% of something called dark energy, and if you add those together, you get 95%. The remaining 5% is ordinary observable matter and energy. So 95% of the universe is something that we cannot see, we cannot measure, and we cannot detect. But if we assume it's there, the math works. No one's ever seen or measured dark energy or dark matter, but the math only works if you assume its existence. So what we've done here is, rather than question our theory of how the universe works, 
we've decided to take on faith. That's a key word here. The existence of 95% of the universe. I find that fascinating uh, and troubling. You know, I don't know that I believe that. Um, and I don't know enough about it to make a, a true conclusion about it. But to me, it just rubs me the wrong way. 95% of the world is something I can't observe. If, as a biologist, if I ran an experiment and said, oh, this doesn't work unless I assume that 95% of the, the, the system I'm studying are things I can't observe, I'd get thrown out of the, the lab. You, know, you just, you don't do that. But that, that is a difference between a observational science and an experimental science. So why the heck am I talking about this in a pipe video? Well, it kind of relates to the how do you get to you when you've got all these random chance occurrences in your parents' meeting and your grandparents' meeting and so on. Well, you've got an observation that we didn't talk about in the previous video. And by the way, I recommend you go back and watch that video. I'll put links uh, above and below. Below, certainly, if I can remember to do it, I'll put them above. You, ha you can make assumptions because while it seems like you're impossible based on all these random events occurring, here you are. You exist with 100% probability, right? You know you're there. So now you can make the assumption that those events were not random because you got a 100% probability of getting you. So you have to start to figure out how that could possibly be. And that, I'm afraid, is going to be um, the topic of a future video. So there you go. I, by the way, am smoking my J. Mouton Lavat with uh, Haunted Bookshop and enjoying it quite a bit. So let's do a little bit of uh, shop talk because you probably didn't tune in for, for a lecture on science. I'm working on a stem. This is my very last stem replacement. I'll show you where I'm at with it. This pipe, I don't actually know what this pipe is. That's not helpful. Mountbatten. So it's Mountbatten made in England. Really pretty pipe. Um, I guess that would be, would that be an apple? Looks too rounded to be a billiard. We're gonna be making a saddle stem. And look at the uh, the material. Isn't that beautiful? Nice brindled ebonite. So we're just at the point now where we got everything fit up. Still got a, you're probably not going to be able to see it, but there's still a little bit of uh, extra material around here that I got to take off to fit this to the shank. We're going to make this a saddle stem, so I'll have to cut in the, the saddle, straighten this out, and do the button work. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's on its way. And this is it. This is the, <laughs> the last time you'll see me. Well, I shouldn't say that. I was going to say this is the last time you'll see me doing a replacement stem, but we all know that's not true. Heck, I've got about four replacement stems I have to make for my own pipes. I've been working on something else. Uh, for the past, oh gosh, I guess it's been about a month now. Because I just haven't had the time to, to work on it. And I'll show you that too. This is a, uh, a billiard. 
and the stem is actually a, a pre-molded stem. I just I decided to make this almost almost at random. I don't have everything set up yet. I don't have. I, I really got to get my dust collector set up. Um, but I wanted to do something, and I had a block of briar, and I said, "Oh, what the heck!" So I had. I'm really using this as a way to kind of get a feel for the tools. Um, you know, how does briar turn on a lathe? Uh, which turns out it turns like any other wood. <laughs> I did this on a wood lathe, by the way. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's been interesting. You know, how 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 does how do the files work on it? The uh, French wheels that I made, uh, how to use those, a shaping wheel, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I didn't want to make a stem for it, so I found a, a pre-molded stem that'll fit that and, and got it sized up and everything. So yeah, we'll uh, we'll keep going with that, but I'm pretty happy. Still, got, still worrying about this a bit, but I think the overall shape is not not too shabby. Got a little bit of a bump in here, I think. I'll probably play with this for another month or two. <laughs> and that's really what I've been wanting to do. Not, I have no dreams of being a pipe maker. But I love them so much, and I so appreciate pipe makers and what they do, that I felt compelled to try. And I've learned so much over the years about the the innards of the pipe. You know, the engineering, the uh, what what gives you a good airflow, how to make a good stem, that kind of stuff that I, I, I just want to spend a little bit of time learning about the ex exterior. <laughs> so, I'll keep you posted. If you follow me on Instagram, I've been occasionally putting a picture of that up. I refer to it as my pipe-like object. So that's what's going on here. It's... Um, I'm not going to be very busy today. I've got to do something with the sidewalks. I mean, they're not terrible, but we're going to have to at least salt and maybe shovel the front walkway because the sun doesn't hit it very much. And I can do that now. It was funny when, when it was snowing yesterday. You know, my wife told me no snow removal for the season. Uh, she'll take care of it. And I, you know, perfectly healthy now because of the recovery from surgery and uh, yesterday she looked at me and she said you, you can probably take care of the snow right <laughs> but god bless her she did it uh, I think she did it three times and we were hoping that it wouldn't snow after I got that surgery but yeah we, we got most of our snow after I got the surgery um, but she's she really did a great job taking care of it and uh, you know, I'll just deal with it today. I didn't do it yesterday because it was just too darn cold and windy. I mean, we had really high winds. I let the dogs out a couple times, and I thought the screen door was going to go out into the yard. It was blowing so hard. When I went to bed last night, it was 19 degrees, and with the wind chill, it was 5. It felt like 5. And those darn dogs went out when I was ready to go to bed and they stayed out in the yard for about 15 minutes just poking around you know doing dog stuff I, I didn't even want to hold the door open it was so cold anyway I uh, I hope you enjoyed this video it was a bit different but something I've been thinking about I thought you as a follow-on to last week I thought you might enjoy it so with that, I'm going to wish you all a wonderful Sunday. I hope the week ahead holds much joy and blessings for you. And until we speak again, I will look forward to talking to you all again very soon. Goodbye now. Mm -hmm.